Hello and welcome to the first of an occasional series of what we're calling audio case studies about the work we do at the Audience Agency. We'd call them podcasts, only we're not yet sure if we're going to put them up on a podcast platform. And that's exactly the sort of question that I'm going to be talking about here, about the power of storytelling, about how it enables you to connect with your audiences and how you need to organize yourself to produce great content. My name is Richard Leeming, and I work with the Audience Agency and Gallant Innovation, which is part of the Audience Agency, on content and digital strategy. And I'm delighted to be joined by Dave Howard of Bespoken Media and producer Vic Turnbull, who does lots of things. So Dave first and then Vic, tell me more about what you do. God, why does Vic get the kind of mysterious intro? Uh, I think we're very similar companies in lots of ways. Um, uh, I worked for 17 years, which feels like a very long time, uh, in BBC Network Radio. That was mostly mostly at Radio 1 and 1 Extra, um, and also making documentaries at Radio 4. And what I do a lot of the time is talking to businesses and brands and public sector organizations, for instance, um, about how they can create podcasts for themselves. So what Bespoken does really is it helps you make podcasts for your organization, uh, and it also gives you the training and the support to help you make your own podcast, should you wish to. And Vic? I'm Vic Turnbull, and I run a social enterprise called Mike Media. We're based in Manchester. And the reason why I get out of bed every morning is to help good eggs to sell their stories through really top-notch, high-quality, awesome audio. So I work with a wide variety of people, but so as well as making podcasts for people, I show people how to make their own. So in, in case they can't afford full production, we do workshops and webinars and show people how they can make stuff using the stuff they've got around them. I've got a speciality working with people-led and value-led organisations. So working with NGOs, charities, social enterprises, CICs, universities and local authorities. Also, this year was nominated for a British Podcast Award, which I am still like proper chuffed to bits about. So I want to talk a bit about that training stuff that uh, you both mentioned in a bit. But the first thing I really want to ask you about is stepping back and thinking about the power of storytelling. What is it about storytelling which has so much power? Uh, that's a big question, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, everybody loves stories, right? I mean, my favorite thing I think ever in the world is to read to my kids at their bedtime. Um, we all, whether we're eight-year-old kids or, or you know, serious grown-ups, uh, we, we buy into characters. We root for protagonists. Uh, it really matters to us. And I, I was always told making radio that, you know, you've done your job well as a radio producer, if, for example, somebody's got where they're going in their car uh, and they can't leave the car because they want to listen to the end of your story because they need to know what happens in the end, what, what happens to the character. And I think if you can create a product, sort of cutting to the chase, if you like, of, of, of your question and the context that we're talking, if you can create a product that makes people feel that way, then what you've got there is the beginnings, you're harnessing a very positive relationship. So if you can bring people into your brand through storytelling, they will be committed to you. They will be grateful to you for bringing to them these characters and this product that they value. Uh, and then you've got them eating out of the palm of your hand, Richard. Yeah. Vic, what about you? Yeah, I think one of the key words that you said there, David, was feeling there's real feeling that comes with storytelling. You know, like those good stories that can stop you in your tracks or make you like yearn for the next episode. It's always like, it's all, it's like hashtag feels with storytelling. And it doesn't have to be the fiction storytelling, right? We're all storytellers. Like whether we're telling our kids stories, like you were saying, David, or we're telling our mates down the pub when we used to be allowed to go to the pub. Um, it's a story about Doreen down the street. We're all, as human beings, because our like our thoughts always follow a story arc. We're we're like attracted to stories. It's what it what it what makes us buzz. So there's real power in that, as David was saying, for brands or companies and organisations to tap into storytelling. And it doesn't have to be like once upon a time there was a cultural organisation 
and <laughs> did this and then they lived happily after after there's other you know like we're not talking about storytelling in that well, you can do if you want like um it's the arc of the beginning the middle and the end and how you can how you can suck them in let's say there's power in there's, there's feels and powers in storytelling you're both talking about feelings and you know it's often said we live in an age of emotion now i mean can you give us some examples of how organizations have used this sort of feeling inherent in stories to their benefit i mean there's lots of examples i mean I've definitely got examples of, of of branded podcasts that that do a really good job for the brands that they work for. Um, don't ask me why this has popped into my head, but yeah. there's uh, there's a really good one uh, by the makers of John Deere tractors, uh, which is <laughs> oh, it's actually wow. a, it's actually an American one. It's called I can't remember what it's called now, but it's on the land or from the land or something like that, and it's quite a down home homespun kind of american vibe um and it is about quite emotive stories so again picking each other up on the words that we've been using that used the word emotion earlier as well i think that's a you know alongside feeling that's another big big part of storytelling quite emotive stories to basically help farmers and and, and people who work with the land to illustrate kind of why that's important to wider society um, a colleague of mine makes a podcast for the Art Fund, which you may well know through the, through your work, Richard. Um, that's called Meet Me at the Museum. And it's a very simple format where somebody drags their friend along to a museum that they might not otherwise have gone to. And then they, they kind of go through that experience. And, uh, and it's basically about, well, it's, it's illustrating the value of museums through a interesting and fun format. And format actually is another word that we might want to dwell on maybe a bit later in this session um go on vic i'm what are your favorite branded podcasts hmm. well i found myself the other night listening to a podcast about the migration of monarch butterflies and i know it was a podcast called the side door and you reminded me when you said that about the music meet me at the museum david it is the smithsonian um organization in in america and they've got various, they've got a podcast called The Side Door, which they go, it's like you go into the side door of the museum and talk about something that's like backstage of the museum. Now, that's a really interesting concept in that they're taking all the institutes that they sort of own and going backstage. And it's really well made and it's funny and it's um, engaging. And it might be made probably for more of a younger audience like children, but I loved it. Um and they built the story of the migration of monarch butterflies through experts and even sounds of the butterflies. They built this story. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. And I'm going to go and listen to some more. Um, I make a podcast for a charity who wanted to not have a boring evaluation report at the end of a funded project. You know, the type where they'd like gather dust on someone's shelf and they don't even read it like one of those. So. Instead of having facts and figures and graphs, we made a podcast of their outcomes and success stories and journeys of their beneficiaries and people who've been involved, involved and touched the project. So they were stories and highlights of human voices and stories who have been impacted by the intervention of the charity. And that's that's lovely and that's powerful. And that's hearing impact from the horse's, the horse's mouth, really. That example you gave there, Vic, of the Smithsonian... That's a really good example of of some of the organizations in the space that we're dealing with here because they make really good use of what's available to them, don't they? So the whole format, the premise, the niche that they've got with that podcast is built on what they already have. Absolutely. Which is this incredible access. In that instance, it's, you know, backstage of whatever museum or, or um, institution that is. But I think any organization listening to this uh, not that organisations listen, any of the people from the organisations uh, that are listening to this will have their own version of that. They will have some treasure trove or other of stories that they will be sitting on, whether that's a museum or a heritage organisation. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it might be about helping them to just unlock those stories and helping them to figure out kind of where they are and how to make use of them. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, more than likely, They'll, these stories will exist in their organisation already. It's not about reinventing the wheel or or um, or trying to get stressed out, trying trying to find stories. They'll have loads of these. 
it's more over shaping the content that they've already got or the information that they have in a way that tells a story that's got a narrative another word we could use narrative I mean, you're right. I did a piece of work for a, 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 an audience agency client last year. And as part of that, we uh, had a workshop and got some some of their partners in. And before we knew what we were doing, we were talking about um, Geordie uh, shipbuilders in Siberia in the 19th century. And it was absolutely riveting. In more Those ways than one. Hey. Sort of <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Boom, boom, yeah. Uh, but I mean, it was a really inspiring piece of, a piece of work for me because the, the the power of those stories, which are sort of sitting unheard of in the archives, were were, were absolutely amazing. Now, I mean, the thing that binds the three of us together is is like you. I started my career working in radio, so I'm absolutely still transfixed by the power of the uh, of audio. I was going to say the spoken word, but there's more to it than that. So, I mean, what is it about podcasts? Focusing on that, which is really really powerful. I love. How, and this is why I got into like, I loved audio from a very very young age was that way that it can it's very personable one so very other very few other mediums uh, you get the opportunity to have that person's direct attention and very rarely do we listen to podcasts with other people you've got one person's direct attention more and like more often than not in someone's ear like my earphones now you're in someone's ear like you're in someone's head how powerful is that? You could do so many things to not mess with the head, but, you know, like conjure up some beautiful things in their imagination. And that's the power of audio with storytelling. It's intimate. It's intimate. There's the classic quote from the old lady who said that I prefer radio to the telly because the pictures are better. Absolutely. And I think we mentioned it before, but that that moment when when great audio stops you in your tracks i love that moment in a podcast and that and that the, the opportunity to do that as an organization for your audience is is fantastic isn't it there's an example i have and i still think about it like li at least once a day about um a guy who's his speech is not great it but he doesn't realize his speech is not great i can't tell it very well um because i didn't make it but it's it's haunt it's haunting and joyful and Honestly, it, 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 like, it, I can't describe how it makes me feel. And that's how, that's, how good is that? That something that you listen to can make you feel. And I use that example in my, some of my podcast workshops as a, as a great example of a, of a, of a storytelling piece, a radio piece. I think you've given me the, uh, the link to the next question there, Vic, because I mean, how do organizations set themselves up to start unearthing these stories and, and telling them? And, and how can you and we help them to do that? Well, first of all, they have to be interested in doing it. I think it's not something you can do half-heartedly. It's, it's also quite a deep dive as well. I think in order to uh, harvest the benefits of having a podcast, it, 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 you're looking at you know, getting six or eight episodes in before you're going to start to to, to, to reap the benefits of connection and, and engagement and all those kinds of things. You can't just do one podcast episode and hope it will make a difference. That, that would be the one thing I would say. Um, and someone like Vic uh, and myself, and there's, there's actually, you know, growing numbers of, of you know, podcasting agencies uh, and organizations out there will, will be able to provide you with, you know, the, 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 the support and the kind of know-how uh, to create a product that suits you. And I think I think the first thing you need to think about as well, if you're an organization that wants a podcast, is to ask why you want a podcast. What do you need it to do for you? You know, is it, for example, to grow your customer base? Is it to keep your stakeholders uh, in the loop or, or engaged with what you're doing? And then out of that question, why, will come the format that you need to create for your podcast to be useful to you. Um, uh, you know, there's no point just saying, oh, let's have a podcast and then start recording. Uh, a lot of thought needs to be put into it up front, into kind of the why and the how, and perhaps as well think about what success looks like uh, and have quite a, quite a strategic conversation about what you want to try and get out of it. Um, and maybe have somebody be realistic with you about what audience numbers you're likely to get uh, and over what period of time. Uh, niche is a really another really important word when 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 it comes to podcasting, because 
that's the difference in a way between a podcast and a, and a radio program is a radio program has got to be quite broad. That's why it's called broadcasting. Uh, it's got to appeal to, to lots and lots of different types of people. But if you're the art fund, I don't know why I keep picking on the art fund, uh, but if you're the art fund, you can make a podcast that is much more specifically about um, things that relate to, to your audience and, and your offer. I think all of the above, but also, I mean, it's the name of the game, isn't it? Audience. Like, who who is your audience? Who do you want to attract? Who do you imagine you are speaking in the lug hole of? That's quite a sensible thing to do is to actually have a a concrete sense of the individual that you're speaking to. Uh, I used to do it a lot when I was doing like lives for, for radio. I used to be a Radio 1 Newsbeats politics reporter. Um, and I used to basically imagine that a couple of my mates were in the studio with me and I was trying to explain something to them. Um, it might have been about the budget or something really dull. But I, I was trying to keep them on board with, with with the storytelling, actually have that concrete person in mind. So you both talked about how some of this stuff can be done by organisations themselves. I mean, what is the difference between a DIY approach and, and hiring a professional such as yourselves? Uh, well, I think anybody can make a podcast. You just need a, a phone, really, uh, to record and upload something. Uh, it really isn't terribly difficult. Uh in, in terms of the mechanics of it. There's also brilliant websites that you can look at. There's, a, there's one that I'd recommend called thepodcasthost.com. Um, if you did want to take that DIY approach. Um, but I think that word DIY is quite a useful one because you don't necessarily want to be devoting lots of your time and lots of your effort to doing something that you haven't got loads of experience doing when actually you'd probably rather be doing what you're good at and what you're trained for, which is, you know, running the organization that you run or, or, or whatever else it might be. And then bringing in, I hesitate to use this word about myself, but I'll use it about Vic, an expert uh, who can help you to, to deliver a product that, that really does the job that you need it to do. Vic, you deliver value <laughs> to your clients, do you? You make it better for them. Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, I love the DIY analogy and I'm stealing that for my workshops. Thank you. I agree. Like, it'll save you time and effort to do, to get a professional, well, someone that knows what they're doing in, because um, we're all not audio producers, are we? We're all not, we're all not trained in this, or this is not our trade. Like, and I say that about social media, pe doing social media, like, we're all not marketers. It's really alien to us. Um, and, but you might want to get yourself, like, hands dirty and start editing and stuff. You might just get a professional in just to sort yourself out. Yes, um, exactly. And I love working with those people, the people that really want to do it and are enthusiastic about it and want a bit of support just to get them on the road. I'm not going to charge them very much money because I love talking about radio with people. I love getting them on the right track of where they want to go. And I, Vic, I know you're the same on that. It's, it, you, you know, the enthusiasm just kind of shines out of you for, for what we do. Yeah, absolutely. I love showing people. I did, I did a webinar this morning and it was three hours and I sort of two people out on how to start a podcast. I mean, I think I scared them more than I sorted them out. But yeah, I, I like, I yeah, I'd like people to do it on their own and see what it's like. There's such thing as pod fade, isn't there, David? Where we can like the DIYs, the pod fade is that the shelves are always going to be half up, or the rooms always going to be half decorated because you've not, you've you've fallen out in love with it. So that's right, that's right. It's like the mechanic's own car is always the the worst car. Actually, can <laughs> I can I stretch my DIY analogy just a little bit further? Because in DIY, there are always things that you are probably best to stay away from because they're dangerous. Uh, and I'm talking about things like the plumbing and the electrics, things that actually you're best off getting a professional in. And in, I think, radio terms and in any, any kind of publishing context, those things are not the plumbing and the electrics. They're libel and defamation uh, yeah. and editorial policy and yeah. kind of scary words like that. And those words aren't actually very scary, but you do need a bit of pointing in the right direction, particularly if you're dealing with anything that's in any way contentious or, 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 or you know, likely to to have a, a diversity of opinion around it. Um, and I think that's, and apart from the creativity stuff, which is the stuff that we kind of live for and why we do this, that's another good reason. There's a reputational risk, I think, associated with with kind of not doing things properly. 
I think you're absolutely right. And I think that it's all very well to have spent this time, uh, which has been fascinating to talk to you on, talking about the benefits of it. But this is, a, I think, a good point to reiterate at the end that for every good side of this, there is a, a need for a professional interface and the, the reputational damage that you do very, very quickly by saying something that you might later regret and publishing it is where you need an experienced editorial head. Um, so, Dave and Vic, thank you very much. Uh, it's been an absolutely fascinating conversation and there's lots and lots of food for thought there. So, if you want to know more, please get in touch with either me via the audience agency or Dave and Vic, their contact details will be on the audience agency's website too. And I'm sure they'd love to talk to you. So, we will be back soon with more on a different topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.